working with Ken and the team at Stanford, early on we talked about the importance of not just coming up with great ideas, but how do we think about getting great ideas out into the world. And obviously investors play an important role in that, in helping things go from ideas to commercializing products. And so today we're really lucky to have three prominent Silicon Valley investors here to give us their perspective as we look at kind of the market opportunity that comes in this space specifically around cognition and dementia, but also more broadly as we think about products and services for older adults. And so today we're joined by Akhar and Lynn Chow from Kleiner. From Kleiner Perkins, Lynn spent eight years at Abbott. She joined Kleiner relatively recently in the last year or two mm -hmm. um, in the life sciences group and also very heavily involved with Rock Health and she's a mentor to the Aging 2.0 generator companies. We're thrilled to have Lynn and her perspective. And we have Peter, Peter Zebelman. He's a managing partner at uh, Palo Alto Venture Partners, which he co-founded back in 96. Uh, Peter has been on, um, involved with a couple of companies that from startup to going public, Avango and uh, Vicinity. Uh, was at Stanford GSB as a lecturer there, and um, great to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And Lynn is a Stanford undergrad alum. Yes. That counts. Yes. <laughs> we can say. I'm sure we're going to figure out the Stanford connection. I'm, I'm from the Stanford of the East. <laughs> yeah. Let's go Harvard. Exactly. Right, so we got a couple of those. So and, Andy Geese is a founder and managing director of uh, Health Tech uh, Capital. You've been uh, with uh, MedStars for 25 years. There's a concept that I haven't heard of, a mentor capitalist, which I thought was rather good. Um, uh, you've been a CEO, a, vice pro uh, a VP, and a board member of a variety of Small companies and big companies, um, too, too many to name, but uh, an interesting stat is $6 billion worth of market cap of companies that you've been associated with helping to grow and um, an and, and HPS alum. So welcome. Thank you. So the very first thing, we're just going to kick off just to sort of orientate uh, the audience in terms of tell us just a little bit about what you do if you have a focus area in terms of your investing, what kinds of uh, companies that you are working with and what uh, is your focus? So and, Lynn, we'll start with you. And what stage? And what stage? Great, so uh, Kleiner Perkins, we have multiple funds. Uh, we have about four funds and two of them probably pertain most to, to the group and audience here. So the first is a um, $525 million I call classic series A, early stage investment fund that's diversified across uh, life sciences, digital and green tech. And we also have a digital growth fund, which is a billion dollar fund that we can then take growth stage companies. So we've been investing in life sciences since the very beginning of the roots of the firm, which I think is a, a differentiator because we also have a strong digital presence since the, gr the growth of this firm too. And so we're able to kind of play both sides of that in terms of understanding the healthcare space. We've traditionally invested in therapeutics, diagnostics, as well as med device, and have been ac active digital health investors. But we also can utilize the resources and the leverage of the network of the digital side of the house, which looks at consumer as well as enterprise software, traditionally in security. Great. Peter? Well, Palo Alto Venture Partners is a much smaller fund. We're a $100 million fund. But we do focus on just very early stage companies, what we used to call pre-PowerPoint uh, companies, <laughs> even before uh, uh, PowerPoint slides have been made about the product. And we have enjoyed working with companies, uh, for example, companies like eSurance, we were in very early on when they pre-PowerPoint. And that's been the fun for me of venture capital, getting in at that very early stage where maybe a whole sector is created. There. We know we're in a good spot when there isn't a name for that particular area yet. And uh, with that combination, that's, that's where we know to go in. And so we've enjoyed working with these early stage companies. Uh, and as Stephen mentioned throughout, uh, even though we're an early stage investor, we try to stay with the company as long as they'll let us. And frequently that can go to acquisition or they do a public offering. Okay, Anne. So, you know, these are the big boys, and I'm just not into quantity, but quality, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and they told me to be controversial, so I really am going out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I started a group called Health Tech Capital, and, and the, uh, the vision there is that one of the big problems in the space is historically a company like Kleiner Perkins and all of that, we're really doing more product risk management in medical devices and biotech, and that's really the way they were set up. Everything I've been doing, which is why I coined the word health tech, is to differentiate because it was all about market risk. This is how do you change healthcare delivery? using technology from the computer world. 
The problem with that, when you do the scene of the Series A, is that I will come to my friends around here and I say, listen, I have this great product, there is no IP, it's run-of-the-mill computer technology, I'm gonna change the market, I'm gonna change people's behavior, I'm gonna sell this to the nurse, who, the nurse? And, and by the way, it's a big market, trust me. And you know, of course, that conversation is pretty short. And, and, and some of these companies became, as I said, multi-billion dollar exits. And so I created this group with a vision to say, you need three sets of expertise in understanding the space. You need to understand healthcare, the regulatory, the FDA, and all of that. Uh, the second expertise you need is technology, not to put things on, an, on a mobile phone to fix diabetes, it's to allow mobility to change the way you do healthcare delivery. And the third aspect is that historically we sold everything to a physician who knew what to do, and we, really ne we never really had to educate them. And when we're changing behavior of a patient or nurse or caregivers, it has to change behaviors. You have to understand how to do the user interaction. And really nobody had these three sets of expertise, so I created an ecosystem there where we have people bringing one of the three, at times two, uh, we have angel investors, a third of our members are physicians, so with deep clinical expertise. We also have venture members, which I have to hit these two to, for membership before they leave. <laughs> and we also have industry members, so we have people like Genentech, Philips, Johnson & Johnson, Adidas, and that gives you the spread of the group. So what we've done is that we do the heavy lifting at the seed level. We're bringing our industry partner to develop this business partnership because of the vacuum. We have corporate VC in my time again, so we've had investment from Samsung and Hearst. Again, things you've never signed this space before. So, sh long story, but that's how we do it. All right, thank you. Great, there's so much exciting things going on. Um, so let's focus a little bit. Today, we know we're focusing on, I think, the, the two Ds we've been talking about a lot, design and dementia today. And so I think design generally is a big trend we're seeing in the Silicon Valley, you know, an emphasis on design, as well as an emphasis on design thinking and thinking a lot about the consumer. Could you guys talk about maybe how you see trends in design impacting the investment space and what you think is attractive and what you look for in terms of design? You have a plan or you have your new product? Yeah, we, we very much believe in that and actually have taken a, a full effort within our fund around design. So we have Product Works, which we've brought uh, John Mieta, who used to be the head of RISD as well as MIT Lab to come in. He's now our design partner. Works very closely with Bing, who's from uh, the gaming world, um, and has been a very active uh, partner in our firm for quite some time, and really bringing together designers. Um, so A, we believe that that's where design's going. You can probably see from some of our investments, such as Nest, uh, which really elevated the home thermostat, elevated uh, the smoke alarm and detection. Um, and so you can imagine a world, now that it's been bought by Google, about how your house is living and helping you live in a lot of different ways, but it was a lot about design and thinking about those emotional connections and how you live your life and then wrapping technology around that versus starting with the technology and then going outward. And so we have a whole kind of group within Kleiner to help our portfolio companies and also just the greater community of bringing designers together. So for instance, John Mieta holds Sunday dim sums uh, with designers from both in the Kleiner network and outside and just talking about design and elevating that very early on in the process. And an example of that, we have another company um, within our med device practice which is looking at dry eye and so we've brought John in and he's really talked to our designers and looked at the early concepts. This is a very early stage company and then kind of brought that ethos of emotion and of who we're really designing for and making sure that comes out through into the product, into the overall service offering and therapy uh, that we're developing. So, so we look at design as an enabling technology to solve a problem. What do I mean by that? In our space, most of the risk is market risk, which is these two questions. Will somebody use it and will somebody pay for it? And that may not be the same person. But we see a lot of things with the young engineers coming to us is that they're really focusing on the technology, but not about why will somebody use it, which in my mind what design is really good at. And so we asked the question about, you know, do you have any utilization data? How long, how long do they use it? You know, what's the dropout rate? A lot of these are due to bad design. Now some of these are fixable and some of these the concept is wrong. So the design is, is a solution to a problem about why would people use this? And then of course the next question is that if they use it, will somebody else pay for it? Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to add that I think it's a great trend that we're seeing more and more companies focus on design. I, I think uh, this idea of a minimal viable product, which uh, if any of you watched Silicon Valley, the show, um, they use that as the title. It turns out they didn't talk about it, unfortunately, but it was a great title for the first episode of that new show. And this idea of going out with your 
earliest product possible just to get this customer experience, get this feedback. And that's the good news. I think the bad news with this trend is that the developers are not necessarily including the cycle time to revise their product after they get this feedback. They think once they're out there, they're out there, and they think they're just going to make minimal changes. And what we found is that products normally should and could be developed to really change radically after this customer feedback. And the idea is to not sweat what the customers think about these changes because you've only brought it out to a smaller group. The idea is to get out, get that knowledge, come back and be prepared for that 2.0 or that 3.0 version that we know typically is the real market killer. And this is the trend we're seeing, and it's a very exciting trend, but allowing for that cycle is the part that I, I'm a little uh, cautious about developers not necessarily paying attention to. Yeah, and I thought this morning, I don't know if you were for this morning there, but you know, in particular, I was very impressed with some of the things you did, where they iterate multiple yeah. times, they experimented, they took the input, they modified, and you get lean and mean virtually do that. And at time, in certain spaces, three months, it could be two years, until you iterate and you finally figure out, then you scale up. And when I say right now, there's a gold rush, there's a bubble, we can talk about more that later there, and people say, I got my first one, I was just going to convince them why they need it, and I scale up, and that's when you have the big burn and crash. It's very helpful, yeah, and I think we talk a lot about the need to involve older adults in this design process, and that's what mm. I loved about a lot of what we saw today, because I think a unique situation in our aging space is that the designers are often, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years younger than their end user, and so I think this importance of iteration is really important. Um, let's switch gears a little bit too. So we know today there's about 5 million people with Alzheimer's disease projected to get up to about 16 million by 2050. Um, when you guys look at the horizon and kind of the aging demographics, are there particular areas, whether in cognition or other parts along the long-term care continuum, that you think are particularly exciting or ripe for disruption or need? Well, you know, I also organized a conference, so I have to put my plug here, but, um, you know, there's an October the Health Day Conference 2014, and one of the big things that, you know, that, that, that everybody's realizing, it's the biggest change in the healthcare industry, and I'll explain you that. 16% of GDP is healthcare. Historically, we just had what I call incremental changes, mostly in diagnostic and therapeutic. We basically, the government has decided, as well as the employer, to say, this is it, we've had it. You know, I'm simplifying things. And so 84% of the cost of healthcare is the delivery of healthcare. And pretty much where we're going is what used to be a, a payer-centric system there, which was more of a B2B system there, where we're going towards what's called retail medicine. And by retail medicine, it's gonna be patient-centric. In certain cases, it's gonna be caregiver-centric, especially in dementia. And as a result of that, we're talking about care anywhere. And or health anywhere instead of care, because care assumes you're taking care of a problem as opposed to be more prevention. So right now there's massive change in the industry. Uh, I've never seen change like that in 30 years. So that's the good news. The bad news is that there's a bubble in the early stage where, like you said, a lot of people come in their 20s and they figure, well, it'd be nice if I could just do blank, <laughs> and I have the spoon that vibrates and says something and fix, you know, Parkinson. And unfortunately, as we know, that's not necessarily a business that's investable. And so, so right now there's an amazing amount of creativity. Uh, but you have to still think about how do you make a business out of this, mm -hmm. otherwise you're not going to get the money from my friends on the left. Right, and I think the way you make a business is not necessarily looking for the numbers. That's my concern. When I see an, uh, an entrepreneur come and offer these large numbers of either the population or dollars and how big this is, I, my eyes kind of glaze over and I say, okay, now where's the problem? What is the problem you're solving? And can you describe that for me? And then tell me how the numbers relate to that specific problem. And it isn't until they make that definition that I get excited about a particular product. And so what I encourage entrepreneurs and students I teach is to look, look for those problems. Look for those big problems out there. We heard in a number of sessions today where people say X is a big problem. Well, there's a good clue that there's a good company there somewhere. But people that develop products in search of a solution or in mm -hmm. search of a problem, those are the ones that that just don't work, quite frankly, in terms of scaling to a big business. Yeah. And they, they really have to identify that big problem. In fact, a large part of my effort is helping the entrepreneurs characterize that problem to make sure they have it adequately figured out. Because they think they do, they've lived with it, they may have had a good story attached to it for maybe a number of years, so they think they understand it, but they really need to define it very clearly. And once they do that, then the solution becomes obvious. So I'm, I'm not a big numbers person. I'm, a, mm. I'm more interested in where's the, where's the big yeah. problem. I think the uh, also distinguishing term, and I agree completely here about uh, we're at this very unique time right now. And you're seeing a heterogeneity of investors 
and you're seeing a heterogeneity of entrepreneurs as well coming into what we call digital health, which is a rather large uh, space, and you could define it many ways. Um, but I think where people distinguish themselves, or entrepreneurs distinguish themselves, are understanding the need very clearly and, and in, in a very detailed way. But then I'll add to that, and I will get to the numbers, is clarity of business model and uh, monetization. And I think you know, we find a lot of features or products, but someone who's really thinking about what I call you know, the company, how are we going to monetize this over the long haul? I think the, the issue and the challenge with this, everything that's ha happening in healthcare today is those business models will evolve and change as healthcare evolves and changes. And so you'll see some of the early investments that we made in digital health um, really go to selling to the enterprise and reducing healthcare costs for the enterprise versus, let's say, the consumer right away. But we might come to a point in time where consumers are used to paying for their health. We have better consumer technologies and UIs and all these things that then we can bank a business model on that. But you'll see some of our early investments like Redbrick and Teladoc. Teladoc is doing telemedicine, but selling to the enterprise in terms of providing telemedicine and then red brick on consumer wellness solutions and transparency selling to the enterprise. So we've been very uh, pointed in terms of the companies that have come to us is where we can really see a clear path to a business model. But again, I think as healthcare is changing, those types of monetization opportunities will change over time and, and we'll ride with that. So, so we're here in the Stanford Center on longevity. There's a focus, uh, a lot of people in the audience, uh, about the aging market in particular and the, the 50 plus consumer. Um, there seems to be this disconnect between, on the one hand, the big market numbers that all seem, <laughs> we've got some wonderful slides uh, that we've seen here in Stanford about the projected numbers uh, of older people around the world. But yet, we haven't seen that many really great, you know, kick ass startups that have made it, that have exited. There's lots of startups now in this space and more and more. I just wondered if either of you had a perspective of what, is, what accounts for this sort of disconnect or the paradox as we sometimes yeah. call it. Well, let me push back on this. Been, I mean, we had a couple of IPOs in the last three weeks. Some of them are eye poppers to say the least. Um, if you haven't heard about Cast Slide, it's kind of fun to go on Yahoo and check it out. Uh, but it, I think what's happening, it kind of goes back to, to what you said earlier, what's the business model? And I think the biggest challenge we have in this space is that we have an entrepreneur coming to us and it says, you know, like all my friends are saying, who are going to pay and why? And, and what do you have to validate? And what will it take to validate your value proposition? So you go to a payer and you say, okay, we're going to basically make sure this patient don't go to the hospitals. So we're going to keep them out of the hospital. You should pay $5 per member per month to do that. And then Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Medicare say, well, this is great, but show me the data. And when they say, show me the data, it's not 10 people. And they're talking thousands of people over several years in a control group and blah, blah, blah. And the problem is that who's going to fund that? That's the first problem. Then you say, okay, fine, I go to the employers. And I'm gonna have Apple and, and all those guys to pay. Guess what, those people are saying, show me the money too. So you get a whole bunch of pilots, so people are having a 250K pilot, it's easy to get a pilot, and they cannot pass the chasm. And they're just sitting there, you know, swimming. The third one is to say, okay, well, okay, that doesn't work. We're gonna sell to the providers. You know, have you all ever heard about ACOs? Or who hasn't heard about ACO? Okay, if you don't, go online. Um, it's basically capitation. So basically the idea there is that instead of you coming and every time you have a problem, you pay for the services, which is a fee for services, they're gonna pay you that you're sick or healthy or not. It's called capitation. I'm simplifying things drastically here. Uh, and so the idea is to say, well, we're gonna get Stanford Hospital to pay for it to keep you healthy. Well, Stanford is saying, well, time out. The alignment of incentives is not really there yet. It's a hybrid system. Some I get paid for fee for services, some I get paid for that. Show me the data again on how the patient doesn't come back. So, yeah, and that's the problem, is that there is no proven models. And I think the model has worked so far is, is, is the B2B, which is you're selling to people there where you have some data. And that's what Castle did very successfully, which is data transparencies where I can go in there and I, can, I want an X-ray and it costs me $1,000 or $5,000 within a 25 miles radius. But are the, seniors, are the seniors using Castle Light? Well, remember, you're talking 50 years old. Are still working people yeah. at 50? The value may be exceptional where people retire at 50, but most yeah. people still work. And so really, you, you have a market up to 65, which is the employer market, and after post 65, you have Medicare. Yeah, yeah with, when someone who is buying the product is not the person using the product, it really makes things much more complicated. You, you do wonder, so I think it's a great question of why can't we just make money the old-fashioned way by selling a product directly to somebody over 50 directly? And, you know, just make a zillion dollars well, that well, way. And, the and best I mean, one was say, Fitbit. Yeah. 
And, and Fitbit plateaued out. And what they discovered after six months the early adopters are dropping out of it. And so that's the closest we've had as far as yeah. you know, direct to consumer. I mean, just simplistically to kind of look at it a different way potentially, and I'm gonna talk about it from a venture perspective. But you need three, three basic things, right? Passionate entrepreneurs who have big ideas, who have probably in this Bay Area technical expertise or industry expertise that then create value in a system and there's kind of a return if it's the acquisition or the IPO. And this is what I call the virtuous circle, right? And we're seeing that now with, I'll call it again, digital health overall with the cast light, and we hope others will follow. But to specifically zoom in on aging, um, we have a lot of digital entrepreneurs that are very excited. They see the paper-based systems. They want to change the world. So we've got that first, we're starting to get what I'll call the first leg. And they have to create value, so how do we create value? But then ultimately, I believe it is everyone in this room that has to work together. If you're an entrepreneur sitting here thinking about the next idea, we've talked about that. If you're people, again, providing that value, building out your technology, working with. But it's also the strategics. And you know, earlier this morning, it's the people who were probably sitting in this front row with the reserve seats right here saying, OK, we're not just going to pilot. We're actually going to buy and we're going to use, and this is a cultural shift, right? We're going to use mobile. We're going to use SaaS. We're going to do all these things. And it has to pervade throughout an organization. And that's not even easy. Um, you know, when I was uh, at Abbott, even trying to get a more direct-to-consumer approach to a medical device, which is a different way of thinking, you know, I'd had to lobby internally. Uh, to many DVPs, to many people who own different things, and legal and regulatory, and I can only imagine, again, but it takes all of us to do this, to create a market and to create a vibrancy of innovation, right? And so I really think it's, are the strategics leaning forward, people who would use this? Are they willing to go beyond the pilot or go beyond the meeting of learning about a technology and truly using it and seeing it as part and partial to strategic advantage in your businesses. And if we get that, that's where we start to kind of have this virtuous circle. And that's my biggest question, honestly, I'll be, and I've asked this to Katie, you know, sitting in a room. Are strategics leaning forward? Do they see this as part of their business and how they are going to create advantage and as a core competency? We might be early in that answer. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at every industry, you know, Aetna is clearly ahead, but the rest are resisting. Uh, you go in the drug industry, they no longer develop drugs, they want to do disease management. Mm -hmm. Clearly some firm like Merck are, cl are actively investing, other people are resisting. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, but what is interesting is that I've never seen in the 35 years I've been involved investing in the space, so much activity at the Series A level by strategics. They usually wait for the B and the C and the product is finished, mm -hmm. buy for $400 million mm -hmm. and they just put into the sales reps and here it goes. This, they're really saying that the, the industry is changing. It could be fundamental to our core business there, and we have to be involved in the early stage. I think I want to and is that happening in, well, I'd say broadly that might be happening in digital health, but my question then is, is that happening in the aging space? Mm -hmm. I was specifically talking about the aging space. Well, the aging space is that most people over the age of 50 are taking medication, so clearly the pharma industry is leading the charge sure. in that area there. Um, you know, CMS is still very confused yeah. about what they want to do there, so there's a misalignment of payment. Mm -hmm. I like Peter's point, though. I think one of the things we talk a lot about is that aging is about more than health, right? I think as we get older, we all want to do a lot more every day than just manage your chronic diseases and think about you know, managing your decline. And so I think this idea of can we just create products that people want and sell them the old-fashioned way um, because you've created value in their life or improve, delivered a benefit someone really wants. And so I think the system is absolutely changing in healthcare, but I think we want to have an even both a more narrow discussion by focusing on aging, but also a broader discussion by focusing beyond just healthcare. Um, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was, was Fitbit, and I'd like to, all, all of you have a perspective on wearables, and specifically, can wearables and the aging market be uh, an interesting overlap, and if so, are we going to see that in the next few years? Um, you obviously have a couple of devices and opinions. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I figure I should eat my own dog, my dog, my own dog food, as I call it. So I bought an Indiegogo, the, uh, the wearables, you know. Shine. A shine, and, and then I got the Fitbit when it came. And I put it into the same pocket, and I figure I'm going to do my own clinical trials. <laughs> and in the best of the days, you know, it was within 
most of the time it was in 30%, and at times it's 50% off the best time I was in Costa Rica, and I broke all the records in one of those, you know, very bouncy road there where I think I did 250 flights of stairs in 30 minutes. <laughs> so I still hold that record. And so, so I think the problem is more psychological. I think it goes back to say the consumer is looking for things differently than what I call the professionals, which is mm -hmm. a physician I'm looking for, which is accuracy. And I think it's more the psychology of this as I should change behavior. I think I, I like to say, if I could take two seconds, my personal story there, I decided that I need to lose some weight. So I did a, a, the genomics of, of my metabolism. I swapped it, I sent it in the mail. And I came up with this thing that says, you have this modification of your gene, that means you need a high intensity exercise. Which now explain why these four hours of exercise was going nothing. And I basically put myself one of these machines. I had, because I launched pulse oximetry, I had my little pulse ox at home. I was able to keep my heart rate at a very high level for the two minutes per day. That's all you have to do. I did warm up before and after. And I lost 30 pounds. And, and I think that's what the quantified self is. It's not just a component. It's getting information, knowing what it means, because when I got the information about my genomics, it didn't tell me what to do about it. Because I'm in the space, I start getting all this public information about saying that people with that mutations there need to have high intensity exercise or heart rate. Six minutes a week is all you need, as opposed to four hours of aerobics. I say, I like that. <laughs> and, and then you have to put into a, a, a lifestyle that's permanently changed. It's not just diet, it's changing it. I think the quantified self, if people use all these components, which is a total solution instead of accessories, it, w it is successful. But my, my concern Anne, is that that's still a niche market. Oh, yeah. And the question still remains, where is that big market? And is it in wearables? I'm not sure because, again, and not to be a downer on, on the prospects here, but is that technology in search of a problem? Mm -hmm. and, well, and so did my Did you go to CES this year? <laughs> I did not this year. Uh, basically, you work down the aisle, 40% had some type of quantified self-measurement in any form or shape. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it's a consumer it's toy. I, it's, it's, well, that's maybe that's the point. Is. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> is it, is that's, that what, that's what I mean. It, it, so, so I think wearables, what, what I would do is just dig deeper say, where's a problem that wearables can solve? It, exactly. Just a reframing of your question. And I think that, to me, then gets exciting, is, is someone saying, um, I'm not remembering things, somehow this wearable changes my life that way. And linking it into the previous speaker, we heard that the killer wonder drug was walking a few minutes a day. So I mean, mm -hmm. maybe there was some, a joined up connection between incentives and the business model and the payers to say, you know, yeah, if you could get everybody But, but can walk. I just interrupt you just for a minute? Because there you gotta be careful. There's a prescription, but where's the problem? In other words, uh, Dr. Longa did a great job of saying he has these patients come in and they, they don't believe there's a problem because they're not changing their behavior. They don't believe they have to walk more. So you, you really have to, to, to get past what I think is good for you or what I think you should be wearing to do you as the consumer feel there's a problem there. Then, then the spark, then the magic happens. Then we see billion dollar companies yeah. come out of that. And, and I, I don't wanna take you too literally, but I, I, I just wanna be careful of helping the entrepreneur go from prescribed solution to figuring out where the problem is. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I kind of say that there's, a di especially in the wearables market, the divide between what I call wellness and healthcare. And wellness is the Fitbit angle if we go from that side of the spectrum. And healthcare would be something like a company we've invested in, Corventus, that helps um, monitor heart failure patients, right? And that whole, they're, they're completely different use cases. They're completely different in terms of how the consumer will engage with them and whether the provider is kind of then engaging with the consumer or not. So I really, and I think that these two segments, I mean, very 10,000 foot, um, have different ethoses, cultures, uh, uh, strengths within management teams, and you, you're kind of one or the other, quite frankly. And very rarely can you do both at the same time. And so I think of wearables exactly as you That's an enabling technology. Mm -hmm. And it's more about now what's the need, the problem, who's, who's, how are you interacting with it, who's telling you to interact with it in some cases. And then that gets to your you know, strategic partners the, and the, the team that's building that, te that company. But it's very different, I believe. I mean, you miss, we're missing the point is that wearables give you a data point. Data point is useless unless it becomes actionable information. That basically change somebody's behavior and that it has a re reward feedback loop to basically you keep sustaining yourself. And, and I think if you look about the space, I mean, who has been successful in changing behavior? 
company just got um, raised, one of our investment company called Mara Health just raised quite a bit of money last week, I think $23 million. Mm -hmm. and, and what they're doing is that they took something that YMC had organized. They go for two 12 sessions, like Alcoholic Anonymous there. And they will work with pre-diabetic patients, which unfortunately in this country is half the population. And, and they will basically educate you on how you should exercise more and all of that with a support system. And I think what we're missing here is that the way we behave as human beings is that we need reinforcement. Our brain does not change behavior unless you work for it for 12 weeks. That's just the way the brain plasticity works. And you need that social support or pressure to change behavior. So what they did is that they took that mouse, which is not very practical because nobody wants to drive 12 times to a location there. And they put this over the web. And long and behold, they were able to show um, I think it's public knowledge before I get in trouble, uh, is that, that they were able to lose 7% of body weight, which decreased by 50% of the chance of getting into diabetes. And it's all about behavior modification. Now use all these tools, which is a point by itself, to reinforce that peer pressure. But I think what's what the designer here in this room needs to understand is that at the end of the day, you have to change somebody's behavior. And your information is useless unless you make it actionable and has a feedback loop so that at the end, you have something you're willing to pay for. I think one thing I would just kind of summarize there, which I think is kind of across what all of you said, is this idea that there's a lot of things that we see are working in long-term care and aging services already that are kind of offline. How could we use technology as an enabling technology to bring them online? I don't think we need to come at it with the technology, but rather look at like the good designers do and see where we see things working or we see big needs and then apply, thoughtfully apply technology to enable um, the solutions we want to see happen. I wanted to switch gears slightly. This has been a global challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps to turn to you, Anne, as a Bel Belgian. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding, you know, we've got, a, we've got a number of people from outside the US uh, in this room. Just any perspectives from what's happening outside the US? Often in Silicon Valley, we sort of live within <laughs> 10 miles. Um, but uh, we know, obviously, the demographics are very different in different countries. Um, there's, I think there's a couple of entrepreneurs here from outside who've got some really interesting novel models with different health systems. So. Can we learn? You know, I'm sure we can, but what can we learn um, from other countries? So I'm glad you're asking that. I mean, I'm from Belgium, and if you look about some of the biggest, what I call government experiment, it's from Holland as well as Denmark. And the reason is that, first of all, they're, they're centralized medicine, so they have the information not for what you've done the last six months, but for the last 15 years. The government is paying for it, and therefore they are willing to pay to see if they can change the outcome because the ultimately the payer is there. So they're doing a lot of experiments. And Philips, that some of you may know, is a massive incubator all about aging and enabling you to age at home. They were one of the first ones to basically have um, you know, IDs and all this very sophisticated technology because Philips in the US on half of the patient monitoring business there, and they're very, very big in consumer electronics. So they have these massive experiments. They have an incubator. They have like <coughs> $200 million of funders to do that. Belgium, the same thing. You know, uh, Belgium had the first country to be socialized medicine. So they have decided that we, the government, and we could politically agree or disagree on how they take that position there, know better what you need because we pay for it. And we're going to do what's right for all of you, even if it hurts a few of us. The US has had the reverse mentality, which is the right of one individual, you know, funded by the legal system, which is more important than the right of the society as a group. And one of the problems with the US system, you have this misalignment of the payment system, which has made it so hard for innovation to find a way of who is going to pay. I mean, that's what we discussed for 15 minutes. Europe doesn't have that problem. There's one payer, and they're taking a much bigger view and a longer view, and they're willing to basically uh, fund these projects there. And these big corporations are doing it. And if I were an entrepreneur, what I would do is use those studies that, that are being done overseas, mm -hmm. uh, figure out what's one. working, what isn't working, then bring it back to Silicon Valley and start that billion dollar company there and get it funded by. <laughs> at at that, 500 million dollar valuation. Yeah, that, that, that's the combination. Yeah, but your it. point about the clinical data, um, the longitudinal data is absolutely unique it's in huge. that regard. Whereas today with meaningful use, we're just trying to digitize it overall um, in the US. The other thing I would note um, when I worked at Abbott, another market, you mentioned Europe, is Asia, where, you know, the the issue here sometimes is, you know, who's receiving the services and who's paying for it. And it's a self-pay market. You know, you look at India or China, that's a large portion of it. Now insurance will probably develop over time. But in some of these kind of more emerging countries, it's an interesting model in terms of you are literally get a menu pricing for your health care. Do you want the multinational? Do you want the FDA approved or the local? And you're making these decisions real time as a patient, which is 
very different model, but it kind of simplifies the chain in a lot of ways. Oh. If, I, if I can expand on Alzheimer's in Europe, because 10 years ago I, I did quite a bit of work in the space there, and the Europeans at the time, because they took a longitudinal data, they did some research to say, well, instead of looking at who you are and your correlation at the time of diagnosis, and by that time you've lost half of your neurons, let's go back 15 years and see if we can predict who is going to decline faster than others. And what they were able to show, because they had all the data, that the, what's called a relative risk factor, and which is the, the higher chance that something could go wrong for you. And typically we get excited when it's 1.5. What they show is that they get a relative risk factor that show that the lack of exercise in their midlife, which is in your 50s, is predictive to you having early Alzheimer's, right? Even if, if being diagnosed with Alzheimer's as you're still alive. Then they start showing it's also linked to diabetes. It's also linked to BMI, which is your body mass index there. Now, when this data came to the US uh, in, in 2003, there was this, oh, wash, it's the European data, who cares? And then Kaiser, and Kaiser here has the longest data of anybody in the country there because the average patient at Kaiser stays, I think, 14 years. 17, or something. Yeah. 17 yeah. years. It's a long time where everybody else is two and a half years. And Kaiser showed, long and behold, they had similar data. And that just came out three to four years ago. And people says, oh my gosh, maybe Alzheimer's is linked to midlife lifestyles which is excess weight, diabetes, lack of exercise, all the things that Dr. You know, Professor Longo mentioned. And again, I think what was interesting, which is an opportunity for me being a maverick, is to say, let's go back to Europe, let's make sure we don't have that cultural bias mm -hmm. there out of the way, and adapt that, like you said, and bring it to the US. Because they have data we don't have here. And I, I did want to add, though, not to seem biased just towards Silicon Valley, is that many venture firms are looking outside of the Silicon Valley and outside of the US for innovation. So the old idea that you couldn't go to a US venture firm if, you, if your idea was outside of the US is done, it's gone. And in fact, they believe it's a less competitive market in Brazil or other countries, mm -hmm. and so therefore they're, they're actively looking. And so I know, for example, firms like Intel Capital, uh, who have a corporate connection and other large venture firms are, are very active in this. So I think it's, it's, a, it's good news that way. Great. Mm -hmm. Do we then, we're going to turn it over to have some Q&A uh, from the audience. We just wanted to, if you were a entrepreneur, we've got a number of uh, entre eager entrepreneurs looking to uh, make it in this space, you know, one word of advice, one um, thing to remember, take away um, from an entrepreneur based on them trying to, uh, to harness uh, some of the trends that we've been talking about. Well, I, I think in my lifetime, this is the best time to start a company in the space. I mean, there's a lot of money and people are aware and are willing to change and try things. Mm -hmm. We thought that that wasn't the case. The danger is that most people are focusing on their product and they do the product demo. And I think when they come to us, we say, well, where is the business? And we look at four risk. You know, uh, um, is this defendable? Not necessarily IP, but the barrier to entry. I mean, how can quickly people copycat it? You know, what is the market? Who is going to use it? Why will they use it? Who's going to pay them? It'll be the same person. What's your value proposition? What will it take to validate that? Some of these value proposition can take years to validate that to the payer. So be very careful there. Then we look at the team. The team is going to execute. That's half the decision at my stage because there's usually three people and nothing else. And you know, how good is the team? And are they aware of the strengths and weaknesses? And are they willing to have other people supplement? That's why we mentor them a lot. And the fourth one, money in, money out. How much money would it take to measure milestones and right now there's a Series B crunch where a lot of the traditional VC have retreated a little bit there and it takes more runway from the Series A to get to the major milestones, but also all money in and who's gonna buy them out because we invest in businesses where we hopefully will make money and get an exit and these are the four risks. And when I see the mistake that people make is that they go to where they're comfortable with, which is technology expertise, they spend all their time focusing on the products and then they come to us, we start asking the question, you know, what's the pain point, what's the value proposition and they aren't prepared. And so. You know, diversify your risk. We are into the business of diversifying risk from the early stage. Your job is to convince us there's low risk. And every stage is basically done in the financing. I think we're in violent agreement. I suspect that Peter will be saying something similar. I, I would, although if I could just mention two things. One is uh, don't be afraid to fail. I think getting that product out there, getting that idea, and hearing that 80% of the people don't like it gets you into the market and you learn so much at that time. And I know we teach about failure here uh, in, at Stanford and in Silicon Valley, but in their heart, it's very difficult to take that step, particularly if you're a new entrepreneur, if this is your first company and you don't have that success behind you. So don't be afraid to fail. It'll get you out in the market. You'll learn quite a bit, and that 2.0 version will be the one that will succeed if you do that. 
And then this we love 2.0. You love 2.0, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Nobody's Can't wait till 3.0. No. Uh, and the second point is just something that I see from entrepreneurs that come to me all the time with their great product, great story. They have got the problem characterized, and what they haven't done is checked out their competition. Mm -hmm. And so, if I could just implore uh, entrepreneurs out there, really take a wide view as to who is your competitor, put it on a chart, think highly of them, respect them, don't don't diss your competitors really learn what they're doing right, and then when you talk to your investors, you'll be that much more educated about where your competitors are and what your advantages are. Uh, I've seen just entrepreneurs just run with blinders on, and maybe that's a good thing, but ignore their competition or, or diminish their value of their competition, and we just don't end up backing the company because we look carefully at the competition, and we believe there's not that differentiation there. So. Failure and competition are my, my okay. two bywords. Yeah, I would say to the failure point almost being just very agile in this environment. Mm -hmm. And my, my postulation is also in the aging space um, that things will keep changing as they are in like the classic provider sense with meaningful use and that that will bleed um, as well as the population, the demographics, and then how you really monetize I think is going to develop in this space. So just being agile as an entrepreneur sort of goes to the failure part. Um, the other aspect that we've, we've talked about a lot of things, so I think we're probably in a lot of agreement. One thing that we always look at too is, you know, there's a lot of piloting happening. Um, and we really like to distinguish, you know, what's the pilot to get maybe get your ROI data? That's fine, understand that's necessary, but then where are the relationships that really have teeth where this is really a phased implementation per se or a real customer coming in and we we will dig on that because there are a lot of again strategics that are doing a lot of piloting these days in digital health and so really understanding what is underlying that and having um, true relationships going forward or the start of that is really important great are there any questions from the group i don't think we have too much time but June had one, and then we had the one on the back. Um, should we take it to the back first? Because um, hand up, and then we'll go to June. Yeah. So I think that it's really interesting um, the questions around the quantified self and the whole notion that um, data does not equal behavior change necessarily. And I think that there's more of a uh, push towards a modified self now, um, schema of thinking about things. I was just wondering from where you all sit, um, to what extent you've seen this sort of shift, or if at all, with the companies and startups that you're uh, working with? Well, we're, you know, we see like 40 companies a month, so you know, we're much earlier on the pipeline, you know, that, that's pretty what you see. And so we see the real early bubbles right now. So I think I would say two to three years ago, there was a lot of people coming from the tech side in their 20s. And they got comfortable with the quantified self because they were the customer. And so you saw a lot of activity there. What we start seeing now is because there has been some issues about how successful that space is, is that people are moving into more chronic disease management into something that's useful in the home, which is in some way the aging population instead of the wellness 20 something. And the question that we have, which is now it gets more complicated, is that that means it has to fit into the workflow of healthcare. Because if you have congestive heart failures and you're going to be looking at, let's say, weight gain, which is an indication that you may have some problems there, you know, somebody has to take this data, analyze, create an alert, and act upon it. So in some way, it creates a barrier of entry in a business model that's more defendable, but it also increases the barriers of knowledge to get into the space. So we see more sophisticated uh, application. And these are the ones that are getting traction with the providers to do the pilots, because those value propositions will decrease their cost. But the problem with the quantified self and the wellness is that it wasn't decreasing anybody's cost. Nobody was willing to pay for it, so it had to go directly to the consumer. And then you end up with low price point and early adopters and not passing the cash. I don't know if you have the same thoughts. No, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, again, the wellness statement to what is truly healthcare, and then just speaking to your point about the system, I mean, Corventus again, which is a true, you know, we have 24 by 7 monitoring centers in Philadelphia and in India, right? This is highly complex. The company's been working on this for seven years. It's a very different company. Um, and so there's probably some blend in between all that because that is also um, a diagnostic, right? So I think there's, you know, how do you play within those lines um, is gonna be, uh, it's, it's very interesting. This gets to 
who you're going after, what is your business model, and being very precise about that. Maybe time for Jane, you had a question? Oh, it's very stimulating. This, this is not a world that I move into. But a couple of comments. One, um, I love failure. And I've been trying to promote the idea at my colleges that we even have our reunion seminar beyond failure. But if you, you're talking about doing it, uh, the smaller thing fail, go back. If you're going to work with the aging, forget it. Because once you have a failure, mm -hmm. nobody's going to buy that product. You could come out with the best product. So you have to do something before mm -hmm. to prevent the failures have to hurt, have been earlier in the game. Also, you know, we're talking about wellness. Let's forget wellness. Let's talk about quality of life. I think that's what we're interested in. And, you know, we talk about wellness, and there's a lot of confusions in it. And yet, obesity and hypertension may be the thing, but actually, if you go back on the famous studies from the Rosetta study, these people were fat, they had diabetes and they lived longer because the quality of their life was much better. And it's disappeared now with the changing. So we have to move back to the okay. issues of quality of life. And what, as designers, you should be doing is to be promoting those things that will, and that means, again, what we talked about earlier with our great speaker is participatory yes. design. Yes. There is no money available, and I'm going to make a challenge to the, uh, to the investors that if you really want good design coming to you that you can invest in, you have to put up some money earlier to promote that true participatory design, and that means before the design is mm -hmm. even thought of. And because uh, too often I've seen around in the participatory design is somebody coming around and saying, well, I've designed this, Versus now just tell listening. me what's wrong yes. with it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you from my right. experience in the medical area, people aren't going to use it if they saw one bad design. And that's just yeah. Get it, no, get I it, agree, I agree think, fully. And yeah. I, I, I was just talking uh, to a team here today about we're also, you know, in the provider environment or otherwise, we talk about, you know, endpoints or cost effectiveness. And there's something I think really here in this space about connectedness. And it's a very, and how can we leverage if it's technology or otherwise, services or otherwise, to create that connectedness to the community, to each other, et cetera, in this space, which I think is a very different, I think it gets to potentially a quality of life, not on like typical PRO kind of aspects, but overall, there's something, something really there, I believe. I mean, there's a famous French paradox, you know, where the French have the same access to all the American technology and all of that. They have the worst lifestyle that we know of. They eat, you know, cream and cheese. They don't exercise, blah, blah, blah. And they have health and mortality rate, let's say, of, let's say, on the cardiac side, and they have longer longevity. The reason is they have different lifestyle. That's for them, the quality of life is more important than, than work. I always used to joke that in Europe, we basically work to live, where here we mm -hmm. live to work. Okay. And, and I think one of the opportunity for designer people here is that if you could capture some of what they do in Europe, which is the social connectivity, the fabric is much stronger there. The support system of the family and all that is much stronger here. We're very isolated. People move around in this country there. If we could find a way to provide that, you may be much more effective than any drugs mm -hmm. and also much cheaper to basically get yeah. it to the market. And so that goes back to the design. Yeah. No, but it's interesting. I mean, on the Corlys side, Katie and I, and another individual we're talking about earlier today, too, is I think we talk about international experiences, et cetera, especially in this film if we talk about connectedness. It's, it's a very different system. And so you have to be careful about transporting what happens in one country to another. I was just talking about aging. You know, in Asia, here in the US, there might be assisted living and long term living. and. Ex you know, in Asia, very typically, the, the kids will bring their parents back in at a certain age and we'll all live together. Mm -hmm. So, okay, what kind of problems is that? What are the needs there are completely different than if my mother or father were living in a separate facility or otherwise. So anyways, I, I think there's a lot of cultural aspects here that you have to uh, be careful of versus transplanting. I, I 
think we have to wrap up, but thank you all so much. And I think you know the point that Lynn made about this virtuous circle and how can we create a market that has this virtual circle in our aging and long-term care space around great passionate ideas of which we saw seven great examples this morning. And then the strategic partners, a lot of the people in this front row who can really help start to test things, bring them out to the market. And then the investors and ultimately the acquirers. We need all those pieces to work for products to get to market. They're gonna help all of us have a better long life with higher quality of life. So thank you all so much. And now. Thank you.